Good morning, good evening, good day. G'day to everyone who's joining us for this live event with the remarkable Sarah Chase. My name is Susan Ford. I'm the Chair of Integrity 20 and the Director of Griffith University's Centre for Social and Cultural Research. Before we begin, I'll let you all know that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Combamere people, the traditional owners of the lands and seas of the Gold Coast region here on the east coast of Australia. I acknowledge the Combamere as sovereign owners of this land, as people who've cared for and nurtured this country for about 40,000 years prior to European settlement. I acknowledge their elders, past and present. Welcome to everybody. This conversation today forms part of Integrity 20, an ongoing series of dialogues and events designed to think about the incredible moment in time we find ourselves in and to illuminate the path to future possibilities. Last week, we welcomed 780 secondary school students to the Integrity 20 virtual schools event, involving them in lightning talks and interactive sessions about the impact of COVID-19, about human rights, our future in space, the challenges of big data, and of course, the impact of corruption. It was an incredible day of dynamic conversations between experts and switched on groups of 15 to 17 year old Australian high school students. We've called this year Integrity 20 and Beyond, so we may think about what lies beyond the global pandemic, what lies beyond the climate crisis, what lies beyond the mooted demise of democracy. Today we speak to Sarah Chase to help us navigate some of these questions and she's incredibly well placed to do so. Sarah's here to talk about her latest work, very concisely titled, on corruption in America and what's at stake. But just three days out from the US election, I suspect we'll also get to that topic as well. Sarah Chase was a reporter for the respected National Public Radio Network in the United States and covered the fall of the Taliban in Afghanistan, which led her to stay on in Kandahar for years afterwards, working on the ground to build and run a soap factory in Kandahar as insurgents re-emerged. She then became one of the cogs in the topmost levels of the US military, serving as special advisor to two commanders of the international forces in Kabul and then to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen. She left the Pentagon for a five year stint at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her work both in Afghanistan and in the years following got her thinking about corruption in a deep way why and how it emerges and what impacts it has, not just on the people involved, but the purpose it serves in undermining an entire system, an entire country, indeed entire networks that traverse the globe. Sarah comes to us today live from Washington DC, where it is about 8 p.m. at night for her. Thanks Sarah for joining us and welcome back to Integrity 20. What a pleasure, Susan. I really appreciate it. And, and I just wish we were all together in person. Absolutely. And we will do our, our best here today. And welcome to the wonderful audience. Uh, we're really looking forward to getting into this conversation. Yeah, I would just like to say a couple of words to the audience. Um, thanking you all for, you know, this is no fun, this kind of setup is awkward for everybody. And you've got a lot to be busy with at the moment. And so we really do appreciate your taking the time to spend an hour with us this, this morning. All right, thanks, Sarah. And this latest body of work that you've pulled together traverses a huge range of human history, which is of course what I found most interesting about the book as a, as a social researcher and, and media researcher as well. You go from Greek mythology through to Twain's Gilded Age and right through then to modern Europe, America and the industrialised and the non-industrialised world. You've really thought about how and why corruption began and what havoc it has wreaked on our societies. So I'll kick off by asking, why did you identify corruption as a concept, as a term, rather than greed or ambition or even perhaps human nature as the core concept in all your thinking? What led you here to focus on? Um, really interesting question. And I'd just like to, again, um, 
assure folks that I don't actually do a comprehensive, you know, survey of corruption from the dawn of time, time until today. I actually selected some very specific moments to focus on, and we can get into why, but, but they were, yes, there's Greek mythology, there's Jesus and the money changers, there's the 19th century, and there's today. So that's really, those were the moments I focused on. And corruption, it goes back quite some time in my own past. I mean, I went to Afghanistan, you know, first to cover the fall of the Taliban as a, as a reporter, as you mentioned, and then stayed because I felt that it was just time to try to do something instead of just talking about it. And this seemed like a particularly important moment in space and time. I had no intention of focusing on corruption. I hadn't really thought about it. It was the Afghans who brought it to me. In fact, my very first project was to rebuild a village that had been destroyed in, in the American bombing. And I couldn't acquire stone. I couldn't buy stone for the foundations of these villagers' houses because the governor had awarded himself a monopoly on stone so that he could be the monopoly provider of gravel to the military base that was being built, which was an incredibly lucrative contract. So basically, from my very first moment, I was plunged into um, the kind of corrupt practices that I've spent, you know, the succeeding years really trying to explore and understand. But it was Afghans who brought it to me saying, this is absolutely intolerable. The behavior of our government, the abuse of corruption of our government. And they were saying, we can hardly tell the difference between the abuse that's heaped upon us by, you know, the Taliban, uh, who are shaking us down at night, as they would say, and the government, which is shaking us down in the daytime. So I was trying to explain to international interveners, including you know Australian military officers who were who were down there in the south as well, that if we don't address the way the government is treating its own um, people, this mission is never going to be successful. And then from there, you know, and Afghans were using words that, I mean, corruption turns out to be a word that translates very well. Um, and, um, and there are various other, um, I wanna say, uh, expressions. I mean, there was an expression called a bribe eater. Um, So-and-so is a bribe eater. Um, and what's, what I found quite interesting is that corruption in every language that I learned how to say the word has the same, I want to say, ambiguity that it has in English. That is to say, it is both a material crime and the notion of a sort of decay of of the moral fiber of a person. And that can be confusing because then you can choose to focus on one end of that spectrum rather than the other. Um, but I went on from there to discover that exactly the same patterns, both in terms of how corrupt networks were structured and how populations were reacting, applied in, I mean, by the end of the time I was looking at, in, at the international situation, a dozen countries scattered across the globe, different geographies, different revenue streams, different political systems, and yet the underlying structure of kleptocratic networking, networks, if you will, was identical. And as early as, you know, I want to say 2015, I was, it was becoming clear to me that this ain't just over there, <laughs> you know. Um, but by 2016, even before the US election that year, it really became clear to me, it, it's time. It's not credible for me to speak about this issue anymore yeah. without turning this, my same lens onto the United States. Yeah. Greed, so just to touch on your words, greed or ambition, so ambition is a really interesting point. Ambition for what? And that gets at one of the underlying factors here, which is that un unusually today, meaning unusually compared to the relatively recent past, money, 
has become the sole yardstick by which people measure their social status. So whereas perhaps 50 or 60 years ago, people at least in this country, and I think in a number of other developed countries, would have competed over other types of attributes, you know, and, and some of those might have been political, you know, public office. Um, that was how, or being a professor in university, or there were a variety of other social markers that you might be competing over. Starting in about 1980, at least in the United States, that shifted. So that today, when you talk about ambition, at least in the United States, and not only the United States, that ambition really is about money. It's not about any of these other things. And then greed, why I don't use the word greed is it's not about money for something I need. Do you see what I mean? It's not about having money so that I can get this, that, or the other thing. People have way more money than they can possibly spend. It's money as a marker for social value, uh, for social status, I wanna say. And so, so that's not quite greed, it's something else. Okay. All right, uh, and, and we mentioned earlier about about Greek mythology and and, and the different um, you know terrain that the book comes goes across as well. And you use the analogy of the mythology the mythological Hydra, you know, throughout the book, the creature with many heads that needs to be destroyed. But each time the hero Heracles severs one of Hydra's heads, two more sprout where it once existed, and you use this analogy throughout to, to speak about corruption and how it can so easily um, yet multiply, I guess. So, so Heracles is fighting this losing battle to contain this creature. Um, why does mythology figure so much in your thinking around corruption? Why has your mind returned to some of these classic stories to understand what's happening today in 2020? Thank you so much for asking that question because it really is central to what I'm trying to do in this book. And what, you know, looking around the world today, um, you sort of say, we have cartoon characters, you know, striding across our stages. And, and what I came to realize, um, so for example, uh, the, the, the myth that I start with is, as I mentioned, the Midas myth. What's fascinating is that in the United States, the Midas touch, that expression, is thought of as a positive. Oh, he's really amazing. He's got the Midas touch. Well, that means we've completely misunderstood the meaning of this myth, which was to explain that, you know, anyone who, again, is sort of so infatuated with money that they convert everything of, of irreplaceable value into, frankly, zeros in bank accounts, they are going to destroy their society. I mean, it's a curse. It's not at all a positive. And, and today, even the word myth is used basically to mean something that's obviously not true, and only dunderheads would believe that, right? That's, that's really the connotation of myth. Whereas, you know, our species has thought about, understood itself and its place in the world by means of myths for tens of thousands of years. And what I came to realize is we've turned our back on this amazing storehouse of wisdom. And as a result, we are forced to live our myths. And quite honestly, I mean, speaking again from here in Washington, there's a wonderful, um, uh, he's unfortunately passed away now, but Joseph Campbell was a wonderful comparative mythologist. And in a book, a famous book called Hero with a Thousand Faces that he wrote in 1949, he goes into a riff on Minos, another uh, Greek mythological character. This is on page 11 of the book. I was so blown away that I still remember the page number. And he's got a two page description of the, basically the psychology of the classic tyrant. Word for word, this is a description of Donald Trump, of the way he acts, of his psychological makeup, 
I, that's what really made me think of this. I was like, oh my God, we've got one of these things in the flesh, you know? And so that's why I really felt like it was, it was important to think deeply about these stories. And so then what I did was actually intersect them with science. So rather than putting myth and science in opposition to each other, I said, how can they illuminate each other? And what I discovered is that Midas actually existed and he was actually a king in Phrygia and Phrygia was a, you know, basically it was a Greek territory in Anatolia. Exa he, he ruled exactly when and where money was first invented. And that means that the Midas myth is in fact about money. And then the Hydra, so it's both that you can't kill it. And I think that's a really important thing to remember today. Today we are watching anti-corruption insurrections exploding all around the world. And unfortunately, what too many of them do is, is once they topple the government, they personify the corruption in the person of the head of state. And when they achieve the incredible victory of toppling that head of state or, or having them be investigated, at, excuse me, and even prosecuted, they sort of go home. And the problem is, and I can speak to Egypt, I mean, just a few examples, Egypt, Tunisia after the Arab Spring, and Guatemala more recently, um, the you know, the, the network, the Hydra has simply sprouted a new head. And so for me, that's also a cautionary tale as people look at the US election uh, next week, even if President Trump is defeated, that does not mean that the American kleptocratic network is either gonna lay down and die uh, or disappear in any, in any way, nor, and the other really important thing about the Hydra, if you imagine this creature, which is sort of got a serpent body, but some thicket of heads, you know, that, that, that are twining, coming twining out, out like snakes from the torso. If you look at any one head, it looks like an independent creature. And that's also a really confusing way about these, the way these networks operate. These corrupt networks intertwine sectors that we typically see as distinct and separate from each other, meaning business leaders, government officials, philanthropists, um, charity, you know, uh, people who run or work in charities and often out and out criminals. And so if we get too focused on one particular sector of activity, we'll miss the underlying fact that the network is operating for the benefit of the network as a whole. So these individual heads that are in, that are in apparently separate sectors are in fact working to advance the interests of the network as a whole, uh, meaning enrich its members, and certainly not working in the public interest. And, and that's a perfect um, segue to, to and, you, and you've mentioned this word a few times, the kleptocratic networks and mm. kleptocracy, and I think it's important to just unpack that a little bit. So we know that kleptocracy refers to accepted, established corruption where a ruler or a ruling elite, a government is using political power to appropriate wealth, to appropriate often the wealth of their own country to the detriment of their people. We might associate this behaviour with someone like Idi Amin in Uganda, with Marcos in the Philippines, these known dictators through history. But is a country like the US in your mind, and I know you discuss this in the book, is a country like the US now a kleptocracy? For how long do you think you would have categorised it as that? How long do you feel this has been going on there? And another, another part to that, would the ongoing description of nations such as the US as a kleptocracy, if we just kept using that word and explaining that this is what's going on to the people, would that be a step towards fixing the problem, do you think, or is that just too big and too complex for people to, to get their heads around? What great questions. So sorry, my answers tend to be long, but it's because your questions are so uh, profound. Um, 
So I set out to write this book in, um, I think it was late 2017. And I, I knew, you know, what I, I expected to find, what I, you know, was going to find, which was that the patterns I had spent um, years after leaving Afghanistan examining the structure and operating principles uh, of kleptocratic governments in countries like, you know, having spent 10 years looking at it in Afghanistan. I mean, Nigeria, Egypt and Tunisia, I mentioned Central Asian countries, Azerbaijan, um, um, Moldova, uh, Uzbekistan, Nepal, you know, I mean, and, and then Honduras, I spent a year looking at similar patterns in Honduras and I was able to isolate, you know, some pretty common patterns. Again, the networks don't behave exactly the same way in every single country. They're not, you know, these are not um, all authoritarian, tightly controlled. Uh, another way of understanding them is, is sort of like mafia families that are kind of allied and rivals, you know, simultaneously. And in different countries, the private sector may be really in the lead with government officials kind of obeying his control. So it is still an integrated public and private and criminal sector network, but it's very much the public sector in control. So, you know, there are all these differences, but, and I expected that, um, I expected, that's a little bit better, I think, sound-wise. Um, I expected that the U.S. would, that some of these patterns would fit. I have to confess that I did not expect the degree to which it does. That came as a, to be candid with you, as a difficult shock. I mean, it was, this was a hard book to write. Even though, even though I sort of knew what I was going to find, the finding of it was still really hard to take as, as a, um, you know, anyone wants to think well of his or her country. Um, and so I would say, yes, the United States certainly now qualifies as a kleptocracy. And I would say that this has happened in stages. So the first stage was really the Midas disease setting in and becoming pandemic uh, in the US. And that starts in around 1980. The second phase then is where in order to capture wealth, the networks start constituting themselves. And that really is happening in the 1990s in particular. And what's fascinating is the networks span the political divide. And so while I found that it was indeed people who are more on the Republican Party or the conservative leaning side, political, side of the political spectrum that really engineered the destruction of the safeguards against corruption in the United States beginning in the late 1970s, um, Democrats happily validated and doubled down on these changes and we're delighted to cash in on them too. So the way I talk about, I kind of talk about that as the validators. And then what I found when I started scratching the surface, even of Trump, and, well, both, I mean, of, of individuals who are leading lights in one party or the, or the other, all you had to do was scratch the surface and find that they were allied and involved with um, people from the opposing political party. So while ordinary Americans are, are clawing each other's eyes out across the political divide, the kleptocratic network is in bed with each other. You know, I mean, all of the, it's, it's woven across that same divide. And that is a phenomenon I've seen around the world. Um, whether is the next part uh, is whether using the word would make a difference. I'm not really sure. And I have to say that kleptocracy is not a word that I'm all that happy with because it does sound a little bit academic and wonky. And so that's also why I didn't really settle on the perfect vocabulary to use. And when I'm talking about networks, I use a couple of things interchangeably, like the Hydra, um, you know, the Hydra metaphor, but also network and, and a couple of others. Uh, just because I sort of feel that different ways of understanding this are gonna grab different readers in, in different ways. But what I do think is critical, 
is that it has become at least somewhat possible for people in our countries to concede that corruption is a phenomenon in our countries, be it the United States or Australia. Um, but we tend to have 2020 vision when we're noticing that in the other political party. But boy, do our cataracts set in when we're looking at our own political party. And so what's very dangerous about that is then the whole issue becomes factionalized and it loses its power to mobilize the population as a whole. And in fact, that's one of the counter moves that I've seen deliberately taken by corrupt networks. You know, the classic example was in Lebanon, which has been the Lebanese population has been fighting the corruption of its ruling elites in particular, so, you know, I mean, in very significant ways since 2015. Um, and the ruling elites have been incredibly adroit at dividing this cross-cutting anti-corruption coalition along sectarian lines. And in the United States, we're being divided up along political and racial lines. And you, you sort of, in, in dealing with, I guess, in, in coming to sort of looking at all the different institutions of society too that are playing a part in this, you went and spoke to some priests about corruption in the book. You recount as part of this sort of, um, you know, trip through, through history, I guess, you recount the importance of Christianity and the stories of judgment to, to many Americans. And you went and had lunch and interviewed some senior church leaders in Maryland. Why? Why did you bring them in? That was actually part of the mythology approach. And so more mythology than history. So when I use the word myth, I don't mean something that's false. I mean a profoundly true sacred story. And so that's in fact, an expression that I end up using instead of mythology is sacred stories. So while Midas, you know, is a sacred story that's no longer probably sacred to many people, what, you know, a story that's much more familiar about these issues to Americans is the four lines of gospel that, that describe Jesus striding up the steps of the temple and overturning the tables of the money changers. And I mean, so what, and so, just as I would have done if I were interviewing people in, you know, in, if I were interviewing indigenous uh, people in Northern Australia, I would look for elders, right? I would, if I wanted to understand what is the significance of, of, a, of, a, of a sacred story to them, I would seek out the elders. And so in a way, these pastors were my elders. And it was quite interesting because they were not, um, they were not very comfortable. I mean, they didn't preach this story very often. Um, the hostess, because these were actually all female pastors, um, it just sort of so happened that way in this group. Um, so the hostess actually printed them out from the different gospels because it's a story that appears in all four of them. And they were reading it and then, you know, and I could tell there was a degree of discomfort and, and, and finally the hostess said, well, you know, I think our, I didn't ask, but she said, I, I think the problem is, I mean, you have the prince of peace and she sort of her voice trails off and then someone else cuts in and says who's whooping everybody <laughs> and it was like oh it was the violence and that caused me to really think about it and indeed in the gospel this is a pretty dramatic moment and this was hard for people who who, who see Jesus as the personification of peace why they, and so what was so interesting is instead of saying, wow, what is it about this that actually caused him to lose his cool, they kind of wanted to just like brush it under the rug in a way. And here's what I found is that basically once you have, as I said before, once you have a society that is 
infected, widely infected with the Midas disease, the elites in that society will start weaving themselves together in kleptocratic coalitions. And that's exactly what had happened in Jesus's day. And, and so then we come to science and history and archaeology, and I discover, wow, the Temple of Jerusalem is the most um, uh, magnificent building complex east of Rome. I discovered that the walls of the temple were gold plated. I'm like, you mean like Donald Trump's bathroom furniture? You know, I mean, I'm just seeing this thing. And then, you know, and then, and who do you have there? Well, you've got the money changers and you've got the Supreme Court and you've, you know, you've got commerce. You basically have, again, in American terms, you've got Wall Street, you've got the national treasury, you've got a military base because there is a Roman military base there. And you've got um, the Supreme Court and the seat of government. So I'm like, wow. That's what Jesus took on. And then what's fascinating is this is clearly a kind of climactic, if you look at its placement in the gospels, it's a, a it's the climactic event in his ministry before the crucifixion. And what it turns out, uh, if you read those four lines, is this is the moment at which the kleptocratic network decides they have to kill him. It wasn't about love thy neighbor. It wasn't about healing the sick and the lame or, or causing the blind to be able to see. That was fine with them. It was when he took on, when he threw all that money on the floor. And then what was really, but they couldn't because he was surrounded by this crowd of followers. So that actually hooked back into the work that um, that I had done on Midas and, and ancient Greece, because what you discover is that, um, and in fact, human evolution. <laughs> so without taking us too, too deep back in time, the, the way that humans have imposed a certain degree of egalitarianism on themselves has been by collectively reigning in their, their meat hogs, if you will, the members of their society that are snatching more of their fair share of, of the collectively hunted meat. And what's interesting is anthropologists who have looked at hunter-gatherer tribes have been able to identify a series of um, ways that the broad-based community can kind of bring these would-be dominators to heel. They don't go straight for off with their heads. They don't go straight for Heracles and chop the head off. They start basically teasing them a little bit. And then they shame them. You know, the teasing is a way of bringing shame on them. Then they might even criticize them directly, which is pretty significant. Then they might ostracize them, give them a cold shoulder a little bit. Anyway, and it goes on all the way across to execution. There are examples of people being executed by bands because they've been taking too much, uh, their, uh, more than their fair share of the meat. But it is absolutely critical, and this goes back to my previous point about factionalism. It is critical in these hunter-gatherer examples for the whole band to basically be in consensus that this individual is committing this act, taking more than his, and it's usually his, but not always fair share of the collective resources. And so you can relook at Jesus's um, activity in this light and say, wow, love thy neighbor that's not about thy neighbor, including the meat hog. This is love thy neighbor among the ordinary people. It's establishing, bringing together the cross-cutting coalition of regular people to form a consensus. And then he um, basically opens the eyes of the blind and then he shows them where to look. And what he does, it's a dramatic act, but really it's a shaming exercise. He doesn't hurt anyone. He doesn't kill anyone. It's not a violent act. It's a shaming. It's a public shaming. And that sequence goes tens, hundreds of thousands of years back in the history of our species. And that is what 
the kleptocratic network of Jerusalem of the day found so incredibly dangerous. And so long as he was surrounded by this cross-cutting coalition of the people, they could not kill him. And so then what they set about doing is finding a way to split up that coalition. Once they were able to do that by smearing him, then they could kill him. Right, and, and I'll, I'll take us forward now because we're, you know, a lot of the book and a lot of our, our conversation so far has been looking at what the problems are, yeah, where the, where the weak points are, I guess. But um, I just wanted to read a little part of the book because it's about solutions and how we Thanks. can the way, the way we think. So you've just got a, a, a part here in the epilogue and it's quite a substantial epilogue that you have in, in the book where you are looking at solutions and what can be done. So you write, I wish some creatives would produce a great cop show devoted to some fictional public integrity squad and that's a capital P I N S, a public integrity squad rather than the usual fare of vice and murder. Citizens across the political divide should be asking candidates where they stand on corporate law and often as they do on gun rights. They might start calling for plans and drafting initiative petitions. Their kids should be dreaming of a job on the integrity beat. So there are movies around and I'm so picking up on this notion that this might come through popular culture. So I'm thinking of Wall Street, the Wolf of Wall Street, the firm. There's an anti-corruption and a heroic call for, integr call for integrity sort of thread in, in some works of popular culture already. Why do you think they're not enough? Why do they not cut through to really challenge the way things are done? And, and, I'm, and I'm, you know, referring there to your call for this, this cop show called the Public Integrity Squad to be created. I think they, they tend to be a little bit preachy and they tend to be full length movies. Um, I mean, that's off the bat, that's what I would say. But your question touches on something else that um, I think is very topical, which is that, um, you know, we're now here in the United States and around the world taking a good hard look at police conduct. But what's so fascinating is we are still riveted on street crime, street crime. And so we're talking about defund the police. And I'm like, okay, there are some police that need to be defunded, but there are other police who need to be refunded. And that's exactly this, the complex corporate crime and corruption police. I mean, those investigations are incredibly difficult to they're very, very um, time consuming. They require you know, very complex records and all that kind of thing. And the prosecution of them um, is, is quite difficult and it's not sexy. You know, and so what I find, and I've been carrying on a long conversation about this with a friend of mine who's a former chief of police of a major US city. And, you know, he says, well, I devoted my life to the kind of crime that really affects people's everyday lives. And I said, hang on a second. The, you know, financial meltdown of 2008, um, that put close to 4 million Americans out of their homes. As many people died in, through suicide because of that event as had been killed in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. How many families were broken up because of divorce? How many kids had to go to school you know, when they were homeless because of that? Um, that's everyday life. And yet we don't see that. We don't see corporate crime and corruption it, the, the everyday impact on people's lives when it, those crimes are perpetrated in the West is not really recognized. And so that's why I, I think it's gonna take quite a concerted effort in popular culture to help people understand this. Yes, good. There's a, uh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I, I was wondering if we can just, there's, and I'll try to be a little bit briefer, but 
But I'd just like to touch a little bit on the Gilded Age and why I thought that was important. Mm -hmm. And just to put it as succinctly as I can, I took a deep dive into the period in the late 19th and early 20th centuries when systemic network corruption was also um, just rampant in industrialized countries. So a couple of things I found, the patterns were identical. The uh, really scary thing, or one of two really scary things was that not only was it the same across political parties, it was the same across government systems. Imperial Germany, the French Republic, the English you know, constitutional monarchy, the United States, all of these countries were displaying identical phenomena. And so that meant that no political system, no more today than in, than in the night, you know, today the problem is the same, that sometimes we think this is attached to a certain political system. It turns out that democracies are vulnerable to it just as much as autocracies are. So that was one thing I learned. And the second thing that's even scarier is I really looked at how did we get out of it? And so while I do have a hefty epilogue with ideas, both in terms of what ordinary people can do in their everyday lives and how they can push for the types of policy changes that you mentioned, I also discovered that back then, there were incredibly dynamic, creative, inventive protest movements of various sorts, both urban and rural, that kept generating brilliant solutions, everything from the eight hour day to breaking up massive corporate concentrate, you know, uh, monopolies, uh, corporate monopolies, to direct election of US senators, to a flexible currency. I mean, a lot of things that later were put into practice, were invented in these earlier decades, and yet they didn't take when these protest movements were generating them. So what did allow them to take later, starting in the 1930s? And the answer I came up with, which is really scary, is that it took the succession of calamities that rocked the globe uh, in the early 20th century. And that means two world wars, um, and a world economic meltdown. And let's just review what that included. Two world wars included two genocides, mass starvation in Europe, use of the nuclear bomb, and then there was also a pandemic that way worse than the current pandemic and a global um, economic meltdown. And what that did was, um, um, was generate enough of the kind of solidarity that we all feel in times of um, shared crisis to allow for some of these reforms to take root. So the urgency of this question here is not, it's not just a moral urgency. It's, although that's very important, I don't wanna use the word just, it's not just about, you know, the impact on democracy. I'm really talking about the, our societies. I mean, imagine what the 21st century version of those calamities might be. And so what I hope we can do is generate the type of solidarity um, the sort of post-disaster ethos that would be required to uh, put some of these reforms into practice uh, before the calamities strike. Sarah, we've got a couple of questions coming in through the chat. What I'd like to Great. do is just touch very quickly on the US election first, and then we'll go to the chat and take these questions. So, so... Last time you spoke at Integrity 20 was October 2016. It was on the eve of the election, which led to the surprising victory, fairly surprising victory of Donald Trump. You're here again for us three days before the election for his possible second term. So I'll just ask a straight question. Do you think Trump will get back in? If so, why? If not, why not? Uh, anyone who made a prediction today would be a fool. Here is what I will say. And I, I don't want to state this as a prediction. I want to state this as something I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the space between Tuesday and, no and January 20th when whoever 
um, when a new president or, or uh, uh, President Trump himself would be inaugurated. I think it's going to be a very ugly period one way or another. Um, I think that ugliness, because, so, excuse me, so much chaos has been sown that, and the opportunities for contesting at so many micro levels, we went through this as a country back in 2000, when you know, the, the fate of, of, of this country and much of the world, frankly, because the world would have looked like a very different place if George W. Bush had not, you know, gained office in 2000, um, um, depended on a completely arbitrary decision by nine individuals in our Supreme Court to cease counting of ballots in one single state. And the same thing happened in 2016, where Trump won by you know, a couple thousand votes in, you know, a couple of particular states. And so clearly the U.S. electoral system is so arcane that it offers many opportunities for challenge, which again allows for individual, it so happened that Florida was decided by the brother of the guy who won. I mean, that sounds exactly like Afghanistan. You got the brother of the, of the candidate who wins is, is in charge of the electoral process in the one state that counted. Um, if I had seen that in a developing world country, I would have been screaming my head off about it. Um, that was back in 2000. And so similar things can happen. You also, and what makes it even more worrisome is there have been um, not very veiled appeals to violence. I don't think it's impossible that civil violence break out in the United States uh, after the election. Um, the other problem that compounds this, and these are all things that anyone who's following will have heard about, but because there are a great many mail-in ballots because of the COVID pandemic, um, those are not counted immediately. They, they, they are begun, you know, you can begin to count them on election day, but often there are so many that that counting is unlikely to be completed on election day. So we're not even going to have any idea what the actual results are by November 4th. Mm -hmm. So all of this adds to the possibility for sowing chaos. Let's say that Biden wins decisively. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be tremendous chaos sown anyway. So normally there's a process for, tr for transferring power, for transitioning to a new president. And indeed, it was Al Gore's decision to concede in 2000 that caused that transition to happen smoothly because Al Gore kind of was following norms and didn't want to see this country descend into civil strife. Trump is not that man. He likes civil strife. He likes chaos. So the, the idea that he would gracefully concede is ridiculous or is unlikely. And so then what you have, for example, there's just been an executive order um, handed down that allows for the moving around of civil servants. This is the bureaucratic level in our agencies. So that's already starting where people are being moved around. All of that will have to be unwound, will have to be reversed. So basically what you're looking at is even if uh, Joe Biden wins decisively and is inaugurated in, you know, without too much um, trouble in January, which is a best case scenario in terms of, 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 a, of a transition of power. Um, it will be like walking in, it'll almost be like in a war when somebody, when one um, army withdraws from positions, what they do is break all the furniture. They spike all the weapons. They make everything unusable. They set fire to things. That is what Washington is gonna look like. Papers will be shredded. People will be moved around. There will be absolutely no history of, of, of the decision-making process that can be passed across to the new team. So all I can say is this will not be an election on Tuesday. This will be the opening bell of a process that's gonna be very ugly and very protracted.
Yes, and I think I think as you say, from the results last time, uh, nobody's making any predictions at this point beyond the fact that it's going to be most likely close and also difficult. Whichever, whichever way it goes. I, I will go quickly now to our questions and I'm very conscious of our, of our time this morning. So one question, Sarah, what can the public do to effectively shift corruption? And we mentioned before your epilogue where you talked about that a bit. Yeah. Awesome. So I, it's a very difficult question and I'm not going to like just tick off a list. Um, I would urge you to read the epilogue because I really worked on it quite hard because I was torn between, is there a blueprint for this? You know, where if I just set out the blueprint and then people could follow it, you know, and I actually believe in, in strategic plans. And I think that we were brought here to this fix um, from a different, ethos through the working of a very well planned out campaign that was, you know, with some turbulence, but was basically executed on, it was basically put into operation beginning in, you know, the late 1970s, frankly, and it was a long range plan and it was very smart and it worked. Um, that succeeded in delivering basically all of the levers of power to this kleptocratic network. So I would love to be able to design an equally effective campaign. But on the other hand, I also think that it's gonna take all of us. I think that we are not the kleptocratic coalition. Maybe they can win with a plan. We are the broad-based egalitarian coalition. And that means we all have to get into the fight. And so what I offered was a um, was several different categories of action. I do think that um, some people need to be punished. I don't think you get the better of corruption without the main masterminds, the main architects and leading figures having to, you know, being punished. And what's so interesting is that in the United States, there has part of this campaign on the kleptocratic side has been to narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow the legal definition of corruption and to reduce the penalties for, you know, so they are, they do not want to wind up in jail. So putting a few, getting a few of them to cool their heels behind bars would be, you know, you need that to happen. That's cutting off some of the heads of the Hydra. But, but in order for that to happen, there has to be sustained public demand. And here we come back to the cross-cutting coalition that needs to rein in the meat hogs. In order for that coalition to form, we have got to subordinate our identity issues to this overarching kleptocracy issue. And I'm not saying ignore our identity concerns, I'm saying it's got to be a both and because the exploitation of disfavored elements of the population is part and parcel of the kleptocratic system. It's, it's um, both a revenue stream and a way of keeping the only thing that can bring it to heel, which is the egalitarian, cross-cutting egalitarian coalition, keeping it from forming. Another element of that is start at home hold your own identity group, be it gender, be it race, be it political affiliation, hold it to its own highest standards. Don't assume that just because you've been victimized in the past, that means that you are automatically virtuous. You're not. You have to, you know, act with integrity as well as having been a victim. That's a really hard thing to do these days. But, um, but I do think there needs to be cross-cutting civic mobilization. But then in the Heracles story, the way he finally got the better of the Hydra was he got somebody else involved, his cousin, who had a cotter, basically a cottering iron. And so every time that uh, Heracles would chop off a head, uh, Ioleus would, cauter, would cauterize the wound. And that is what kept a new head from sprouting. So you can talk about a reform agenda as being essentially the cautering iron, cauter, yeah, cautering iron. And so 
Um, there are various elements of that reform agenda, but it has to do with bribery and gift taking. It has to do with uh, money in politics. It has to do with um, the chokeholds on our democracies. I mean, in the United States, we've got a nine person Supreme Court and a seven person Federal Reserve Board of Governors that are basically making every significant political decision in, in our so-called democracy. That's ridiculous. So there are some institutions that really need reforming. And then the... Um, in particular, what in the United States is called the revolving door, the ability for public officials to immediately cash in, you know, once they leave office on their public duties, but in the private sector and vice versa, that has got to be stopped. So those laws have to be very much reinforced, but then there's a lot we can all do ourselves. And that means things like, you know, in the center of kleptocratic networks around the world is the fossil fuel industry. Everywhere, energy everywhere is in the center of this. So that means getting off fossil fuels, you know, and the environmental devastation that, you know, results from this economy is part and parcel of kleptocratic capture. I mean, it always devastates the environment, both carbon-wise, but not only logging and 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 various other things. And and again, I'm aware that you guys are headed into the warm season now. And I can imagine that is happening with some concern. So, but we can also break up some of our monopolies. Take your money out of the mega banks, put it into a local savings bank, put it into shop locally where you can, as a neighbor, impose a certain degree of accountability. I mean, you know, and there, there's goods and services where we can't do this, like, for example, telecoms, you know, or our internet providers, but where we can, we ought to. So, so Again, I just urge you to take a look at the epilogue because I really tried, I really do think this is gonna take all of us. And that means there's something for everyone to do. There really is, depending on your abilities, your gifts, your yens. And, and you know, are we gonna have to change the way we live? Yeah. You know, convenience is almost as dangerous a drug, you know, as money is. And are we gonna have to maybe give up some convenience? Yeah, and then it turns out that getting into this fight and changing our lives in some of these ways, it's not a painful sacrifice, it's fun. It's fun, let's get together with our neighbors and make a celebration of it. Sarah, we do have one more question, but we only have one minute left, so... Um, and it's probably a bit of a big question, which was really, which is essentially what historically has worked well to systemically crush corruption. And I'm not sure we'll have the time to fully cover that. Do you want to have a go at that in third? Yeah, just quickly, it really has been the type of combination of efforts that I'm talking about. So uh, I think the best example really, at least again, from a US perspective, but similar things were happening in a, in a, in a number of other countries was the series of reforms that started kicking in in the United States in the mid 1930s. And that included improved you know, working sta uh, labor standards. It included anti-monopoly. It included you know, a variety of these things. And there was a, a tremendous public pressure in favor of this. There were strikes happening uh, across industries and whatnot. So it really is this sort of multifaceted approach that I just described that really I think is the only thing. So it really is a network systemic response is the only thing that can get the better of it. A network systemic response to a networked systemic issue. Problem, exactly. We are at time, everybody. Uh, look, thank you very much to Sarah for joining us this morning for me, this evening for her, all the way from Washington to, to here in Australia. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for this Integrity 20 event. It's been fantastic to be speaking about corruption and to be looking at how we might get to uh, improving, I guess, our society and certainly our politics at this point in time. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us again. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We look forward to seeing you at another Integrity 20 event soon. Bye for now. Um Thank you.